All right then, shall we, uh, shall we begin, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, the answer is yes. Anyway, good afternoon. My name is uh, Andy Smart. Um, I'm Director of Society Programs with SAE based here in Detroit. And what I'd like to do is uh, give an indication of what we refer to as the big picture. With uh, vehicle connectivity being, uh, you can't really move within the, the press, whether it be automotive, commercial vehicle, or aerospace, without seeing connectivity, what's it all about and how is it literally all connected? What I'll go through with you this afternoon is really relating to the aerospace element, the automotive, uh, commercial vehicles, some on and off road, and some of the other influences that go across sector as well. What we do within the organization is actually look at uh, all of the different sectors and start putting together very sort of complex market drivers just so we know what is really uh, the, the key drivers in each of the sectors and therefore what to do in terms of different events, papers, standards, etc. But this is a, a relatively simple chart showing that the number of share drivers we have across all three sectors that we refer to really as mobility. One of the key elements really is connectivity. You can see there's many others that you can see are uh, that you can relate to very much in terms of fuel consumption, energy security, efficiency, etc. But the key one for this afternoon really is, is connectivity and going across all of the, uh, the, the different sectors. What I'll tell you at the start, during and at the end is this message. That really if you look at the common themes across all the mobility sector, there's two key themes. Efficiency and cyber threat the good and the bad, but hopefully without the ugly. The key element for these aspects, when you look at efficiency, it really can put it from a consumer point of view or also from a commercial perspective. But the cyber threat also varies um, across all of the different sectors. So what I'll go through with you this afternoon is really where it is from the connected aircraft when it comes to commercial aviation the automotive sector, which I think you're probably most uh, acquainted with, relating to both automated, cooperative, the infotainment element, but then also finishing with the, the commercial vehicle sector as well. And then really just the end element, really talking about the cyber threat and uh, really the, the industry's uh, re reaction to this. If you look at the key use cases when it comes to commercial aviation, you can see them really the four key elements there. One, really the, the health management side. Obviously you're looking at uh, scheduled and unscheduled maintenance. This is very much up and down time, so it's a very key element within the industry. Um, no fault found, or the reduction of no fault found. This is a, a key element also. A lot of the reporting in terms of the flight path uh, work in, in terms of um, the systems onboard aircraft. And then also, uh, proactive intervention in terms of what's happening when the, uh, when the aircraft itself is on the ground. When you can see to the other elements, obviously cabin connectivity, which we all can appreciate more as passengers, uh, as you can see there in terms of what's happening within in-flight entertainment, etc. The longest list you have there really relates to the operations management, and this is where a number of the efficiencies come in, in terms of where the connectivity is. If you're looking at different uh, wind updates in terms of what's happening in flight, how you be rerouted, how you can go to a slightly more efficient flight path uh, at a different uh, altitude or what is happening and how you would actually make detours based basically at the wind at different altitudes. When you look at other aspects too, obviously element at the bottom there, reporting emergencies. This is something that uh, something we don't want to uh, have to do, but obviously is a key element. But connectivity, and especially in light of uh, many recent um, issues, this becomes an extremely important point, which I'll get to later. Air traffic control is really going through a, a major change uh, at the moment with the, the next generation of air traffic control system, and connectivity plays a key part in this. A lot of elements here, again, go back to the efficiency, because then you're looking at uh, takeoff, in flight and landing. But a lot of elements that are going on are actually the third point there is really reduced flight separation. And in doing this, basically, you can get more aircraft in the air at one time. 
but there are elements relating to this, and there's actually an optimum distance between aircraft, which in fact our, our standards group is working on just to find out what that is, because you can actually have a lot of turbulent, it may be good on paper, but it may not be so good for passenger comfort. Moving on. If you look at some of the key drivers and challenges within the uh, commercial aircraft area, obviously you're looking at the areas there in terms of the traveler's desires. Some aspects relating to cockpit modernization, where you have to realize that from uh, the automotive point of view, uh, we are forward fitment. From commercial aircraft, a lot of it is retrofitment as well. So one has to take this into account at all times. Aircraft prognostics, as I went through before, is also a key element here in terms of maintenance, and especially in uh, commercial aviation. If you look at uh, where we may set up in the morning, and well, 22 hours later we'll end up in Florida, um, 22 hours later you could be in Nagoya, you could be in Seoul, and you have to have everything on the ground there for you. So a lot of the prognostics and basically uh, connectivity of the aircraft in terms of overall maintenance can assist this in terms of where you are on a global basis. If you look at some of the challenges that come here, obviously POS point of sale. So when you're making purchases on board aircraft, what is that? Some things are uh, cost prohibitive, people don't want to pay. I think you may understand, well, it's a, a service on board flight, why should I pay for these things? The cyber attack must be considered. That is also uh, on board. Um, when you look at the number of providers, this is also very limited service in terms of what's there for connectivity at the moment. If you look at a number of elements here, when it comes to connectivity for airline operations, a lot of these elements can relate to transmission new flight plans. When you uh, think of a pilot going on board and you see a very large bag where all the flight plans are there, mm -hmm. that is a thing of the past. Uh, one would have your flight plans with you on uh, potentially some kind of tablet. But now, uh, depending upon uh, weather and other issues going on, you can then look at uh, the transmission of new flight pa plans, which is seen as a very positive thing. Obviously, passenger connectivity. The opportunities here, it really comes down to almost an IT industry element, less so of the, uh, that of the, uh, the aerospace side because of the standards involved there. And when it comes to legislation and mandates, the thing that you have to be quite clear of next to the nuclear industry, uh, aircraft industry is the second most regulated. So we think in the automotive space, we are hard done by because of regulation. I think the expression is you, you ain't seen nothing yet unless you go into this particular sector. I said before in terms of the next gen traffic control, that's key element as well. Uh, but obviously these standards are going ahead and they have to be really from a global basis. You then have these things split into cockpit and cabin, uh, almost like a division of church and state. This is very much uh, seen from a security point of view. Um, a lot of it, when it comes to the, the cockpit systems, there's agency mandates, FAA and, and the likes on a global basis. It really comes down to a lot of, as you see there, sort of aircraft status, position reporting, etc. cetera. Um, because there's such a wide variation between different aircraft models, but you could say, well, there's Airbus and there's Boeing and Embraer. There's a relatively small number of OEs compared to, uh, say, an automotive. But there's a wide variation of models and different uh, configurations of these, and especially relating then also to, to cockpit connectivity based upon the age of the plane as well, going back to the retrofit element. Certain solution types, again, different. Um, certain connectivity is digital VHF, air-to-ground links, uh, which is something Obviously, from an automotive point of view, it's a little different. But when you come to 3G and 4G, it's something we're used to on personal connection devices. But this is also involved in aircraft, literally why it's at the gate, but also certain elements that are happening in flight as well. So these are some of the common factors you start seeing and start to rise in this. Um, but clearly, in terms of the, the, the technology element here, um, a lot of air traffic control versions that are coming, they're being mandated into Europe and elsewhere, and then going on a global basis. But a lot of it relates to satellite communications. Cabin systems, two elements uh, on board. Obviously, you've got the operations side in the cabin. Then you have the, the passenger part, which depends more connectivity than your heart may desire in terms of uh, what you may want to see streaming live video or 
whatever your imagination uh, takes you to. But that, that's the key element of what the passengers are looking for at the moment. The key thing when it comes to legislation is flight safety. Safety is a pre-competitive pre -competitive element within the uh, aerospace domain and is something that is, uh, is very much number one. So whatever happens uh, on board within cabin, flight safety has to come first. When it comes to different solutions, there are different solution types that I'll take you later on. Um, but when you look at some of the, the, the value chain and the connectivity suppliers, there are few here within the airline industry. And it's clear at the moment there are, it's really looking at the public's willingness to pay. So therefore, commercial viability then becomes a question for many of the, uh, the different suppliers. So if you look at the regulatory point of view, uh, bearing in mind what I said before in terms of how regulated uh, the sector is, some of the elements that you look at the moment uh, is clearly uh, issue with interference. If there is an issue, again, going back to flight safety being uh, mandatory, certain vulnerabilities. Um, but what they have to be very careful of is almost the interoperability, as you see there, in terms of systems really not being built to airborne equipment standards. What's the longevity? What is the connectivity, etc.? And where are the replacement parts? So again, it has to be a very, very well thought out system. And in terms of other uh, radio frequency energy that's coming along, this also is a key issue as well, going back to the safety issue. Electronic flight bags themselves uh, literally were the flight bag, as you uh, remember seeing, but now they are as a, in a tablet form. Basically, you have a number of different versions. One, the pilot can take a, uh, a tablet on board, not connected, has all of his information on there. Uh, but then there's other levels which can then end up being then fully connected into the, uh, the aircraft cockpit system. But it is what protection device there is in here. It's almost like bring your own iPad to work. But if you're a pilot, you may have a certain issue with that. So therefore, there has to be a lot of uh, protection devices involved here. When it comes to different perceptions, um, when you're saying shared, it's the share between cabin and, cabin and cockpit where there is most concern at the moment because they would like a clear division here. Um, and that's one of the increasing concerns. Uh, and when it looks from an airline point of view, it's the key aspect in terms of safety. That is the paramount importance. There are a number of different technologies, but the, the one I just wanted to share, obviously, as we look at uh, third and fourth generation, this is something that uh, is also within the, uh, the aircraft side and has been around for some time. When they've looked at air ground, uh, different wireless, we're looking at different providers here, Verizon, AT&T, et cetera, have been doing this. But a lot of element uh, relates to what we have on Pico cells on board and how this can be in terms of cellular communication. So this is something that is uh, gaining ground at the moment, but I think uh, as a passenger, may, you may not want people to be using their cell phone regularly, especially if they're sitting next to you. When we look at the automotive version of this, it's far more crowded. But when you go behind this in terms of the different frequency bands that are being used, I know within the automotive space, we're still trying to pursue the 5.9 gigahertz DSRC element. Here, there are multiple, multiple bands in play in terms of frequency. And you've got to look at something on a longevity point of view as well. So the key thing a lot of these things in terms of the satellite, satellite communications, what you're doing in terms of connectivity, will relate, relate to the uh, oceanic separation. And from that, in terms of uh, hopefully reduced flight time or efficiency and then fuel usage as well, going back to the efficiency element uh, where we started. So what's the key trends as you see there at the moment? The flight bag point of view, different classes on board from a pilot's perspective. The Pico cells in terms of what's happening in terms of uh, cellular communication. You can't get away from the big data, big data element. Uh, it's there from the airline's point of view, but it's really looking at the passenger experience. What they're trying to do is the same we're trying to do with every other element that's trying to take uh, customer data. Um, and then what's happening in terms of other uh, wireless devices on board. But some of the key conclusions and takeaways, a lot of connectivity is being driven by the airlines. Obviously, there are the regulatory element coming in as well. Um, a lot of the OEMs are recently involved in the connectivity. They have been involved with the air traffic management for many, many years. But the other connected, 
connectivity element is really a lot others a lot of aspects are being driven by the providers here. But some of the providers are not yet profitable, and therefore if that's then the case, a number of very are more are very hesitant to get into that space at the moment. Um, but there's more using it, but it's a case of is it there's a free offering. Automotive sector. You all remember this one. 1939. Um, these were connected vehicles, but they were connected by mechanical means. And this is in a canyon in, uh, in, in Colorado. But the But how they put it, it was increased speed and safety. That was a key element. You can see it all um, available on YouTube. Um, but the key element there in the, in the late 30s, it was done by General Motors for the World's Fair. It was very clear then that this is something as a technology. I looked at that and I thought this must have been something that was similar to as we experience in the automotive side. Uh, when is uh, the oil going to run out? It's always been 50 years. When's this going to happen? It's always going to be in 30 years' time. Now it's a little more to reality. And I think in, in that sense, um, when you go through a number of uh, key messages from uh, OEs, whether it be um, on commercial vehicle or an automotive, again, it's down to increased speed and safety and then fuel efficiency. Same drivers as before. Fast forward to the connected world of today. Uh, v to V, V to whatever, X to X, as it really is now, depends on your uh, buzzword bingo. But clearly, as we see it at the moment, whether it's vehicle to grid, grid to vehicle, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to device, to infrastructure, it, it becomes really, the, the vehicle becomes the node of the internet of things. It's just another thing. Uh, or the device you have on board that's connected into your car. So it becomes a little more uh, complex to this. When we look at the overall connectivity, it's a case of on automated driving, what are the key launch strategies? We can see much in the press about this, but some are, are hesitant at the moment, in some cases, it may be good to be a fast follower rather than being the first because there's so many other, uh, shall we say, uh, legislative or in our litigious society we live in, it could be an issue being the first, but from a technology point of view, very much uh, people are being quite cautious. The cooperative element as well, obviously we have here um, certain decisions coming. DSRC is obviously seen as a key element at the moment. But when a lot of cooperative driving is then dependent upon infrastructure, this may not be the case, but uh, I've always been used to seeing in this type of space is about the 30-30-30 rule. Um, the smart device is about 30 weeks. The vehicle is about 30 months. And the infrastructure is about 30 years. <laughs> that may not be the radio side of the gantries and you see on the top of the road, but a key infrastructure, that's, it's not too far adrift. And so there is a slight mismatch in terms of the technology development, implementation, and then also uh, the turnover and development time. So as we see there also when it comes to the connected side, obviously it's the bring your own um, smart device, uh, other aspects in terms of what's happening uh, on board. But then a lot of it when it comes to the big data analytics, I think some aspects when we're looking at our overall providers, I'm very much expecting to have a call one evening from the people that call you and ask if you'd like to bundle your plan, but they also include along with your cell, your cable, your all these other things, and would you like to include your car? This will be with us in the next few weeks or months, so that's something to look forward to. Um, the companies and the main providers are looking to this, and it's really how can they bundle all of this in. And so a lot of the key uh, movements in the area at the moment is really the commercial side from these uh, particular providers. Obviously, the automated side, uh, when it comes to the uh, ADAS, the driver assistance, and active safety. When it comes to this um, fully automated, we, we all know, I think within the industry, know where we are at the moment in terms of development what's on the road at the moment, what's moving on. 
what can actually be put in place right now. Obviously, there's multiple redundancies, much software, much testing uh, still required to go fully automated. But we are on levels of automation right now. And from the press point of view, what's coming out now, what's coming out in 2017, etc. Uh, there are. It's really how we commercialise highly automated vehicles. But I think the key point there is the commercial success is based upon who's willing to pay, and for what. And some of this really comes down to the connectivity as well, where we may show a little later on of a bygone era, it may have been performance of the vehicle, but now it's the performance of the connectivity that will actually make the sale rather than the horse burn torque of the engine and whatever you have on the floor. So in terms of the key takeaways we have, in terms of the sort of cautious approach of who's been first, um, obviously a lot of liability and safety issues. Many people, uh, if we look at many industry groups at the moment, it used to be many engineers around the table. Now it's many engineers with many lawyers and many people from insurance companies. So a lot of people have a lot at stake as regards to this new level of technology. A lot of the key features at the moment where we have what's already in service at the moment, which are main sort of driver assistance, lots of HMI and different connected services. But really prime is the semi-autonomous, semi-automated vehicles at the moment and what we have in terms of this jigsaw, which is not fully complete yet. I was saying at the moment where we have in terms of where the factory fitted is, obviously that's from the OEM point of view, but could Google offer or what Garmin did or what people did within sat nav systems offer? Um, here's the aftermarket approach. I think this goes back to the bottom left hand in terms of its liability and safety issues. I don't know what you'd entrust your vehicle to in terms of levels automated driving if you bought it for $9.99 and it was on, as seen on TV. Moving swiftly on. I think then, as the benefits we've seen at the moment in terms of the convenience, safety, mobility, a lot of it very much related to the safety aspects here. Obviously, from NHTSA's point of view, looking at the number of driver deaths per year, 32,000 or so in terms of what can be reduced. And it really is, as we've gone through the last 10, 20 years, when ABS saved so many lives in terms of the uh, airbags, many other uh, safety features and now we're getting to the point where the amount of technology required for saving those lives is becoming uh, is growing at an exponential rate. But a number of elements here also related to automated driving is then when it comes to fuel efficiency as well in terms of how we can do that. What comes from a connectivity, what can be done from fuel efficiency, similar to what we saw in the aircraft as well in terms of can you replan your route? What's the interaction with the other vehicles in terms of uh, different safety systems on board? But what we see here at the moment, obviously it's the, there's a government role in here as well. Obviously NHTSA is very active in this at the moment. A number of the connectivity um, requests back from industry. But it's a case of uh, the market penetration of certain safety functions, the societal risk, and really what we're looking for is the societal benefits because a lot of areas it's the consumer that we're finding has really isn't too sure. The technology is coming at them so quickly. The consumer is actually just being overwhelmed when it comes to car purchases. So where we see at the moment, as we look from left to right in terms of where we've been and where we're going, it's a case of where we see over the next few years. I think this reasonably well aligns with a number of the uh, releases made by OEMs recently in terms of where we will be in terms of different navigation. Um, platooning, autonomous parking, etc., and what type of automation is then uh, on board. This isn't just an SAE plug. It, it really is a case of what was involved in recent uh, standard in terms of automated driving. There was so much different talk in terms of what the different of automation, autonomous vehicles, even the terminology. And really, from our point of view, the, from the initial standard, was really putting this together in terms of where we are in terms of level of automation. And this really has been very helpful, bought into by the industry, uh, going to on a global basis. Conclusion and takeaways. From the uh, OEM point of view, consumer education is clear in terms of what is the benefit to the consumer here, not just from a safety point of view, 
because the consumer thinks that uh, safety is inbuilt. Why should I pay more for safety features? Surely that's uh, mandated. Um, so therefore, why should I pay? What are the other benefits that are on board? What's happening in certain tier one suppliers? It's been a little bit of the Wild West in terms of different uh, acquisitions of different companies and technologies at the moment in terms of trying to grow and get critical mass very, very quickly. But obviously, all the major tier one suppliers Technology and development, if we're on uh, Belle Isle a number of weeks ago, we could see that in terms of the number of vehicles, no, number of suppliers there in terms of technology demonstrators. So really just a number of areas really in on the middle on the, the right-hand side. It's the new business models that are coming up in terms of uh, different types of uh, relationships of um, where automation can be there in terms of uh, different autonomous valley parking. What other things can come up? So the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well, especially when it comes to uh, autonomous driving. When we're looking then at uh, just the general connectivity of the vehicles we have at the moment, obviously the different tests in terms of uh, DSRC, where we are at the moment, number of applications. This is something that uh, we feel very much is key, but when it comes to the infrastructure side, I know uh, something with the SA standards at the moment is work, working very hard on in terms of DSRC. Um, but it's then uh, who's going to benefit from this initially? The key stakeholders who are involved here, when can the, uh, the automakers and the tier ones clearly benefit? And it's not from day one when it comes to some of these elements here. But then when it comes to a number of, uh, it's the cooperation with the infrastructure again, which has to be key. So it's infrastructure and it's really the connectivity and the standards between the two. So as we know, in terms of what's happening in terms of from left to right, what different functionalities there are, what's being added in here. So this is almost the, the jigsaw of what's coming together. And when we add the vehicle-to-vehicle the -vehicle data in terms of what's happening here in terms of the... Uh, lane changing. And when I was coming down here today, I was only hoping that the vehicles next to me had this. They didn't. And also, I'm finding a lot of 8 to 10-year-old minivans at the moment that have had major s performance upgrades, because that's another issue I'm having on the road as well. But that's nothing to do with this presentation. Um, clearly, in terms of the number of vehicle-to-vehicle, -vehicle, uh, a lot of the safety issues here, safety um, benefits that are coming on board here. But then also when we get to the uh, vehicle, to infrastructure, to the vehicle, what can happen in terms of complexity, geometry, information, a lot of it, and it comes down to the overall efficiency as we, uh, as we started with. So when you see in terms of this becomes a little busier in terms of a lot of the, uh, the roadmap in terms of what's happening over the next few years, um, but it's, it's similar when, when we look at what's happening uh, also in Europe as well in terms of DSRC, what's happening in the US, different SATCOM, going back to what we spoke of in aerospace. But a lot of the technologies are becoming shared. This, uh, I find this interesting, obviously, the other day when autopilot uh, was introduced. It, it's not new in terms of some of the technologies there, but I just wanted to, just food for thought here. Um, the car at the top, obviously, um, number of over-the-air software updates that can happen, uh, what were happening in terms of autopilot, it's very good. But some similar engineers are actually working on some other automated uh, vehicles that have gone up into space recently. So where we've looked at a number of companies uh, which have been very vertically integrated, a lot of companies now are using companies within the same enterprise and the technology within there. We know in terms of what's happened of the unmanned uh, Dragon craft that's been going uh, to the space station and back, obviously unmanned. They're going to go for manned in the next few years. But a lot of the technology that's being used there, what can happen within the automotive, what can be shared. So this is where we have to do a lot of sharing within the technology realm. And this becomes somewhat of a challenge. So some more key takeaways in terms of where we are in terms of the uh, road users, insurance uh, providers looking to benefit from this initially in terms of uh, connectivity, but then uh, it will take several years thereafter, we think, for autom the automakers and tier ones to get further benefit themselves from this. When we look at a number of not all connected vehicles are automated, not all automated are connected. But what we're looking at here is a, is a number of vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle can be simpler solution, can help from an overall safety point of view. 
Um, so again, it's another piece of, uh, piece of the jigsaw. The infotainment side, obviously we're looking at uh, very widespread growth currently. It's really a case of where we are at the moment in terms of we looked at uh, some of 3G and 4G, what's happening here in some of the infotainment models. Um, commercialization, this is where it becomes a bit different to what we're doing in the normal automotive market. Who are the companies involved? Um, it's not the normal companies that have been involved in this space in the past because they see it from an entre entrepreneurial spirit point of view. Um, especially the devices that are being used here, that there is uh, there's a space for them here. But when it comes to a, a number of the, uh, the, the models that are being used, as you can see there, it's not in just in the US and Europe as well. It's really an explosion of a number of the startup companies, um, which is, is very good, but then it's a case of how long before the companies then will then cash in, move on, becomes a much bigger model. But uh, when you look at the size of the market in the next few years, that's why many people are uh, very, very interested. So when you look at uh, this particular map at the moment, nothing particularly inspiring or exciting compared to where we were before, but it is then a case of uh, different levels of connectivity from an infotainment point of view. And then when we're looking at some of over the air, going back to the, the Tesla model, um, over the air updates are seen as something that could save um, the industry a great deal of money. How can this be done? What connectivity of the vehicle can you get there? So that's obviously a key element. Some of the key takeaways then. Um, there are certain driver distractions elements that NHTSA is very much involved in at the moment because uh, this is seen as very much a, a key safety issue at the moment. Um, new revenue elements as regards to in-vehicle advertisements. It's just what we needed more advertisements, but this time in your car. So it's then a case of also how we can look at certain uh, data transparency, what can come in, how can we monetize some of the data to and from the vehicle. So again, a lot of commercial applications very much in, uh, in play. If we look then at the, the commercial vehicle sector, the third of the three, um, what does this really come down to? We're looking at certain fleet management solutions. Um, how this can then be used for certain truck platooning, similar again to the, the connectivity for the, uh, the automotive side, but also prognostics. Uh, this is some, seen, obviously, there's many links now between the commercial vehicle space and aerospace, because they're then looking for an overall optimization of maintenance, uh, reduced downtime. Um, so this is seen very much as uh, very key in this particular space. When it comes to the legislation side also, it's then, that's also very much uh, key in terms of the um, electronic logging um, for time the driver is in, in play. And a lot of areas at the moment for truck connectivity is extremely important because if you look at the turnover rate of drivers for over the road trucking, uh, it's over 10% over in terms of the turnover rate. So the trucking industry is looking, well, how can we maintain the drivers? Uh, how can we simplify the driving experience? So we can look for a pool of, in some cases, maybe less skilled drivers because we have the skill now in the cab, not in the driver. So there's many drivers, many drivers uh, for this. So in connected trucks, um, the electronic logging device very much is uh, pushed at the moment. Um, very much vehicle management, driver behavior. This is what's coming on board, so we can then look at, again, optimization and efficiency from a driver, uh, how we can look at uh, increased use of smartphones, OBD, uh, two solutions. Again, it's then looking at telematics in this particular space, but again, very much on efficiency. Um, and there's many platooning solutions started by Volvo many, many years ago, uh, but also much work going on now here in, uh, in the US. So look at the key trends here. Obviously, the smartphone adoption into fleet. Uh, what's happening from the overall telematics side? That's growing very much so in terms of the OE space. The big data side is becoming far greater here because they're looking at the, the driver information, what can be done from an optimization point of view, all down to optimization, uh, uptime, reduction of downtime. 
some of these solutions then, when, from a technology point of view, it's consolidation of what's happening within this particular space. Because they're looking at how can we uh, then retrofit some trucks, what can we look at here. So it's very much seen as some, uh, again, a lot of uh, commercial work going on in this space right now. And a lot of it is then looking on the driver services. Driver and fleet services are key. If you look at the off-highway side, we, we mentioned uh, the DSRC for um, automotive application. They're also looking at that for mining applications as well. Because if you've ever been to mines and seen a mining truck, um, and looking at that next to a pickup truck, there is an order of magnitudes in terms of size. And so they have to have something that these trucks can communicate to one another actually on the site itself. So DR DSRC is actually being used as a technology on mining sites then for these vehicles to at least know who's where from an overall safety point of view. So again, it's linking certain technologies in one sector with another. And that's one I, I particularly like. If you look at certain industrial applications, we're looking at tracking certain equipment. Um, there was a picture on one of the, the front slides there, which is on a sub year pipeline. You have to get all of the uh, connectivity data uh, from an overall maintenance point of view and to see what's happening before it really happens, especially in uh, very adverse climate conditions. And that's really the tracking of the expense of heavy equipment. Mining, as I said before, obviously it's a safety point of view, collision avoidance here at the moment. So telematics are quite key in this area. And then from an agriculture, um, machine health, productivity, it then comes down to the price of food on the table, all about efficiency. So if you look at uh, three of the elements in terms of the off-highway telematics technologies, some of these are, are similar to what we're looking at in automotive, some are quite different in terms of the construction side, ag and mining. Um, but it's just a case of it's alive and well uh, in the off-highway side. This is not your grandfather's tractor. So if we look at in terms of what's happening in fleet management, uh, clearly Europe was starting in terms of the truck platooning where North America is very much on its way to looking at tested assisted truck platooning, which if we look at the overall uh, road network in the US is far more conducive to this than it is in parts of Europe. Certain solutions, OBD as I went to before, but it's then bringing people into the value chain in terms of this overall fleet management side, and this is where a lot of new people are coming on board here. Connected trucks, um, we're looking at certain fuel savings and efficiency savings as well when it comes to different applications. Um, again, it's then looking in similar to the automotive side. Again, identifying different road conditions, rerouting, especially when you're looking at dangerous trucks to different controlled situations and also from the efficiency point of view. Again, it's weather, even down to wind. If you look at the overall aerodynamic of trucks, aerodynamics of trucks, and then where can you go and different routes planned accordingly. It's not just about uh, UPS always turning right. It uh, could be actually based upon weather of where you put truck fleets in the future. So when we look at the different types of the cooperative driving, obviously uh, it's looking at overall traffic efficiency, again, similar to the automotive. Um, but then when you look at different uh, Defining different zones, where can you go on a most efficient basis, especially with low emission zones, especially in Europe cropping up here, where can you go, where there are different fueling types, if we're looking at CNG, if we're looking at other different uh, fuels, what can happen as regards uh, connectivity and communication to the truck, knowing where you are in f fuel levels, fuel efficiency, and where the nearest uh, uh, station is for refueling. Different functionalities, different technologies, Again, when you're looking at uh, platooning, you're looking at very high fuel savings uh, by reducing the overall aer aerodynamic drag. So not only you've seen the uh, figures in terms of fuel savings just from aerodynamics on a single truck, when you have a series of six or seven, uh, the savings are much higher. So there's very much a uh, motivation uh, to do this. So really we want to get uh, this regulatory intervention that I said we wanted. I said there will be regulatory invention um, really post-2015 as we see at the moment. 
Um, again, similar to what's happening, NHTSA is very busy right now with a lot of the new technologies coming up in terms of connectivity, as you can see. Um, but it has to be very much in conjunction with a certain ITS plan with infrastructure as well. Um, so that's very key for us at the moment. Michigan is very much uh, involved in a lot of the communication elements, as, as we know. This is one of the elements that I spoke earlier, although this may not be as uh, extreme as the uh, SpaceX and Tesla uh, element. This is just taken from uh, SA publication recently with, with Daimler. Um, you look at their new 2025 truck, um, autonomous driving. Obviously, that's for later on. They've got many active systems. But when you go through the laundry list of active systems, you may have got these on your S-Class only. You're getting this on a much larger truck these days. So again, it's looking at the technologies on board and actually sharing them across different parts of your organization when it comes to the truck side to the car side. So you then have um, very much some economies of scale from a technological perspective. So to finish off an area that really is, uh, I've said efficiency is a key theme through it all, but obviously cyber threat is there. As soon as you have connectivity, unless it's with uh, two tins and a piece of string, then this becomes more of a threat for you. Uh, as I said before, it really is the, uh, whether it become the aircraft, the truck, or the car, you become one of the things on the Internet of Things. And because of this, it then becomes one of these areas that becomes uh, of great interest. Now, when it comes to the cyber threat, obviously, you can go to many of these uh, conferences that people can tell you how they manage to um, break into certain vehicles, and the threat is real in certain elements. And we know that by doing this, there's certain, I think, the, the impact of um, certain levels of cyber threat. That's what we have to really look at at the moment. And it's really the impact if we look at the, the three sectors. Um, if you just look at the commercial vehicle sector, one gentleman who will remain nameless just said, we know, you're, we know the hackers are there. We just want to make sure they can't get very far. So it's a case of how do you do that? And how do you have certain redundant systems that are not connected? Um, and we know that in terms of Caterpillar, this is a number of years old here, already in play. So although we may think the automotive industry is at the cutting edge with all these things, a number of these players have been wrestling with this for many, many years. If we look at the overall standard side for uh, the cyber threat, obviously looking across the globe in terms of EU application, where we are at the moment in terms of the US, um, in terms of uh, guidebook has just been uh, issued under development, should I say, anticipated for later this year, key recommended practices. So we have uh, part of uh, within the technical standards domain. But there is one element that, that is being used across uh, many, many industries. So an ISAC, which uh, NHTSA had uh, published recently in terms of their um, keenness to have something developed here for the auto ISAC. Um, information sharing and analysis. When it comes to cyber threats, a number of the OEMs are dealing with this in their own ways. And because it is a threat, it is not a lot of public information. So a lot of people don't want to talk about this openly. And you can understand that. But what is uh, being dealt with really across the globe is then how can the industry develop the knowledge uh, to either fight back or actually have the knowledge of impending uh, threats. What's actually been found is a number of threats. Um, people like to publicize. The fact is that they are going to do something. That's where a lot of these hackers uh, seem to get some kicks. And they do a lot of data mining in this area to actually find out in advance. So with a lot of information sharing, you can actually get a lot of information in advance of what may well be happening. But what is, is happening in this field at the moment? You can feel secure. Uh, within the mobility sector, there are a number of information sharing um, analysis centers already in play. One, uh, recently within aviation. Companies come together, share information here at the moment. Uh, what is impending threat? What can be done about it? What can be put into play? A number of the sectors, 18 or so sectors there were before, the financial sector is one of them. I would all say that, that is somewhat important. Um, a lot of work is being done, and they're sharing a lot of information with some of the other ISACs that are coming on board as well very soon. Automotive, uh, SAE is very supportive of this at the moment with uh, the Auto Alliance and Global Automakers. But also in the commercial vehicle space, this is so vast within maritime, public transportation, over-the-road, and motor coach. 
if you can only imagine um, what would happen, not just on a car, and people seem to think this is, is key, if you were to go over, road, over the road truck or bus or airplane, the threat becomes much larger. So this is something that uh, industry is working very hard on in terms of how to keep them out, but also how to share. And it really is at the bottom of the cross-sector collaboration. That's also where SAE is involved in terms of the overall collaborative approach. But it's really having the companies discussing, sharing the information of what to be done about it. So this almost is a very much a pre-competitive element. So as I said to you, I'd start and finish with the same. So as we see as the key common themes in terms of connectivity, across all the sectors, key one being efficiency, and cyber threat. Thank you very much.